Hello! My birthday was September 2nd, so to celebrate, I've decided to upload episodes from my mindfulness podcast series, Reading with Carrie, every day through the month of September. Once we hit October, I'll be posting the episodes every Friday with the bonus minisodes on Saturday. To catch the episodes as they air every Wednesday, you can subscribe to my podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Click the link in the description below to go directly to my podcast's website. Hope you enjoy! Hello and welcome to Reading with Carrie, a mindfulness podcast series that can be used as a sleep aid or to ease your anxiety and relieve your stress. I am your host, Carrie Fable, and I am so thankful that you've decided to spend some time with me. This is the first official episode of this podcast, if you don't count the introduction, and I'm quite frankly a bit nervous, but I'm excited to start this venture. I've been dreaming up this podcast for at least two years, if not longer. It actually started as a YouTube series, but that's just a little bit of trivia for you. Now, full disclosure, this story was pre-recorded. As I mentioned, I've tried this whole podcast thing before, and I wanted to release this series with a playlist already available for you, uh, so to do that, I pulled from my previous work. Without further ado, let's start with a basic mindfulness breathing exercise. In a comfortable sitting position, with eyes open or closed, arms wherever they are comfortable, Legs in a relaxed position. Take note of your body, the shape that it's in, the weights of each limb resting together. Breathe in deeply on a slow count of four. Hold the breath for just a moment and focus on the sensation in your chest. Breathe out on a slow count of four. And listen to your body. Feel the sensations, the touch of each part, the connection of you with the item you are sitting on, a chair, the bed, the carpet. Feel yourself relax. Soften your breath in a slow, steady rhythm. Don't alter your breath. Just feel the natural flow of your breath. Feel how your body naturally goes through the motion. Where do you feel the breath in your body? Can you feel it enter through your nostrils, in your throat, down in your lungs, or deeper in your stomach? Feel the sensations of your breath. And don't try to anticipate the next movement. It's all right if your mind wanders. Just gently refocus back to your breathing. Stay in the moment for a few more breaths. Feel your body in the surroundings. Where do your arms rest? What are your fingertips feeling? Where is your tongue settled in your mouth? Go through each part of the body. Now, what do you hear? How many sounds can you decipher in the room? Does your breathing make a noise? Is your stomach gurgling? Take another deep breath in on a slow count of four. And as you release this breath, feel your relaxed mind slowly come back to this podcast. Don't rush. Sit in this moment a while. Indulge your sensations in the bliss. Let out a peaceful, audible sigh. You've earned it. I hope 
hope you feel as relaxed and peaceful as I do. Today's story is a classic, Sleeping Beauty. The Sleeping Beauty by Charles Perrault Once upon a time, there lived a brave king and his fair queen. For years, they longed to have children, and at last the queen had a baby girl. Her baptism was celebrated royally. All the fairies in the land, there were seven that year, were godmothers. This was a good practical idea. Their gifts could make any baby perfect in every grace and virtue. After the baptism, the king gave a party for the fairies. Seven places were set with big gold dishes that winked with diamonds and rubies. There were forks, knives, and spoons to match. As they sat down, in came an old, old fairy. No one had thought to invite her, for she had shut herself up in a tower fifty years before. Everyone thought she had died long ago, or been enchanted. A place was set for her at once, but with ordinary silverware. Only seven golden settings existed, for they had been made especially for the godmothers. The old, old fairy muttered angrily, Insult me, will they? They'll see. A young fairy heard her and feared mischief, so she waited to be the last to give the baby a gift, just in case the old one tried any tricks. The youngest fairy gave the baby great beauty. The next gave her wit. The third gave her graciousness. The fourth and fifth made her an excellent dancer and singer. The sixth gave her skill with musical instruments. Then it was the turn of the old, old fairy. Spitefully, she said, The princess will cut her finger on a spindle and die. Everyone was shocked to tears. The seventh fairy stepped up, saying, Fear not, your majesties. I can't undo this wicked wish completely, but I can change it. When the princess cuts her finger, she won't die. She'll sleep a hundred years and be awakened one day by a king's son. The king did what he could. He made a strict law forbidding spindles in his kingdom. But alas, the bad fairy's magic was too strong for him, as he was to find out. One day, fifteen years later, the young princess decided to explore the castle. High in a tiny room, where nobody ever went, she saw an old woman, smiling and spinning, a distaff in her hand. Please, what's that? asked the princess. A spindle, my dear, said the old woman, who hadn't heard of the fairy's curse. May I see? the princess asked. As she reached out, she cut her finger on the spindle. She fell, unconscious, to the floor. Help! called the old woman. All the king's servants came running. They tried frantically to revive the princess. They put cold linen to her head, ammonia to her nose, rose water on her wrists and brow. Nothing helped. When the king saw her, he knew the curse had come true. He gave orders to the maids in waiting. Soon the sleeping beauty lay in her best dress, in a room all tapestried with gold and silver. The magic sleep increased her beauty. Her cheeks and lips were rosy. The soft sound of her breathing showed she wasn't dead, but sleeping. The fairy who had saved her life was a thousand miles away on the fateful day. But a dwarf, who owned a pair of seven-league boots, sped off to tell her the bad news, and within an hour she arrived at the castle. The king explained to the good fairy the arrangements he'd made for the sleeping girl. He asked politely for the fairy's opinion. The princess might be sad if she wakens in an empty castle, said the fairy. I'll provide her with company and servants. The king and queen watched as she put the household to sleep. Soon everyone slept. Maids in waiting, chambermaids, serving maids, upstairs maids, downstairs maids, maids of all work, cooks, potboys, houseboys, stableboys, valets and butlers, guards and gardeners, and all the animals in the royal stables. Even the princess's little dog, Poofle, was put to sleep at his mistress's side. Then the king and queen kissed the princess and went off to live in another palace. The fairy made a thicket of trees and thorny vines grow overnight around the castle. It was so dense that neither man nor beast could cross it. It was so high that nothing showed above it but the tops of the castle towers. Sleeping Beauty was in no danger from idle curiosity. A hundred years passed. The king of that time had a son who went hunting one day near the thicket. He saw the castle towers and asked what they were. He got fifty different answers. One man said witches worked there. Another said it was alive with ghosts. 
many thought it the home of a hungry ogre. Then an old man said, When I was a boy, my grandfather said that a princess slept in that castle. A fairy put her to sleep for a hundred years. Only a prince can awaken her. The prince felt sure the old man was right. What an adventure, he thought. I'm going to see for myself. Thoughts of love and glory made him brave. He went toward the dense thicket. As he came near, the thorny tangles drew magically apart. He went ahead alone, surprised to see the thicket close tight again behind him. Only he could pass through it. Within the courtyard, all was silence. Men and animals lay everywhere asleep. The prince went into the castle, passing through room after room of sleeping people. At last he came to a golden room, and there on a high bed was the fairest sight he'd ever seen. The sleeping princess was so lovely that even the sunlight seemed brighter where she lay. Trembling, the prince knelt beside her, and, since the hundred years were up, the princess awoke. She looked at the prince as if she'd known him always. "'Is it you, my prince?' she whispered. "'I've waited so long!' The prince's heart leapt for joy. He told her at once that he loved her absolutely. Meanwhile, the other sleepers had wakened too. Since they were not falling in love, they were all very hungry. The maid of honor announced firmly, "'Dinner is served!' The prince helped the princess to rise. He didn't say that her dress, though lovely, was very old-fashioned. In style or out, to him she was perfectly beautiful. They dined well, while a quintet played music popular a hundred years before. The prince wasted no time. After dinner, the princess's chaplain married them in the castle chapel. The next day, the prince went home. He told his family he'd lost his way and spent the night in a lodger's cabin. He kept his marriage secret from his mother. She was an ogress by birth, had a bad temper, and hated surprises. At the end of two years, the prince and princess had two children. The elder was a girl named Dawn, the second was a boy, and they called him Day. Soon after Day's birth, the old king died and the prince became king. He announced his marriage and brought home his little family with great ceremony. The next summer, he had to go off to war. He asked his mother to rule in his place. When he had left, his mother sent the young queen and her children to a country house in the woods. A few days later, she came to visit them. She called the cook and said, I want little Dawn for dinner tomorrow. Oh, your majesty, said the cook. Yes, said the queen, in the urgent voice a hungry ogress has. And mind you, make a tasty sauce to go with her. The poor man knew there was no arguing with an ogress. He got his knife and went to Dawn's room. The little girl ran up laughing and asked for a story. She was so sweet and merry, the cook couldn't bring himself to hurt her. He left her in peace. In the barn, he chose a young lamb and prepared it for the next day's dinner. Meanwhile, his wife hid Dawn in a hayloft. The ogress queen ate up all the lamb greedily, saying, She's even tastier than I'd expected. The next Sunday, she said to the cook, I want little day for lunch. He didn't protest but hid day with dawn in the hayloft. Then he prepared a tender young goat for lunch. The ogress sent him her compliments on his cookery. So far he had managed well. But then the ogress said, Now I shall eat the queen. Make the same sauce you served with the children. This was going to be difficult, the cook thought. The queen was over twenty, without counting her hundred years sleep. The farm animals were too young and tender to resemble her. Fear for his own life made the cook decide to kill the queen. He went armed to her room. He was no sneak. Respectfully, he told her the instructions her mother-in-law had given. Do as you must, said the queen, tipping back her head. I'll die gladly and be with my eaten children again. She didn't know her children were safe. Her bravery disarmed the cook. No, my lady, he said. I can't do it. You needn't die to see your children. I've hidden them safely, and I'll hide you too. The old queen will eat a deer in your stead. He hid her in the hayloft and cooked a young deer. The ogress ate every bit, very pleased. She planned to tell her son, when he should return, that wolves had devoured his family. But one day, the ogress went strolling and happened to pass the hayloft. She heard children laughing and a mother's voice hushing them. She recognized the voices. It was the young queen with her children. The ogress was furious to see she'd been tricked. She howled, Get the biggest basin in the kingdom. Set it in the courtyard. Before tomorrow morning, fill it with snakes, vipers, 
toads, and a few spiders. The queen, the children, and the cook will be thrown into it to die. And I'll watch. The next day, the ogress's servants made ready to throw the young queen into the squirmy, loathsome basin. Suddenly, the king rode through the gate, home unexpectedly from his wars. What on earth is going on here? he demanded. No one dared speak. The furious ogress saw she couldn't always have her own way, so she jumped right into the basin and was eaten up in an instant. The king was upset for a while, but his distress gradually disappeared in the pleasure of being at home with his beautiful wife and his two pretty children. The End This story is very different from the Disney version that was so popular. Seven fairies instead of three, sleep for 100 years specifically until a prince finds her, and it's actually quite sad to think of all those servants who left behind their lives to sleep in the castle with the princess. And the ogress queen seemed like a different story altogether. That aside, this story talks a bit about destiny and how some life events cannot be stopped, though we may try. I think there is a connection to mindfulness-based cognitive therapy here. There is no use in worrying about tomorrow, and yesterday already happened. Like the prince who dealt with his sorrow over his mother's very odd death, we should instead choose to focus on the good and be thankful for what we have, as he was grateful to be able to spend time with his family. I will leave you with this anonymous quote. Gratitude turns what we have into enough. Thank you for listening. I welcome you back anytime you may need to hear a comforting voice or a familiar bedtime story. Title, The Sleeping Beauty. Author, Charles Perrault. Version, The Golden Book of Fairy Tales. Translated by Marie Ponsot and illustrated by Adrienne Segur.